Yeah, hi everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Um, this is our second talk here. So I had already a talk about QML best practices. Those who have already seen my first talk, they will probably note that this time, this time the slides were created with help of a designer. <laughs> um, yeah, let me please introduce my colleague. Um, this is Samuel Knoch. He's user experience designer. Um, Just have to and the presenter <laughs> Sorry. doesn't work. Sorry. No. Okay, yeah. There we go. So this is Samuel Knoch, user experience designer. My name is uh, Friedemann Metzger. I'm a software engineer and um, we are working at ErgoSign. We are one of the leading user experience companies here in Germany. So we provide user experience design and UI development. <laughs> so, well. Somehow the batteries might be. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just. Oh, that's funny. Okay, we'll do like this. So we are doing <laughs> user experience design and user interface development, and um, we're doing that from many fields, such as um, consumer, industry, and also medical solutions. So what we are doing the whole day is creating user interfaces. And we are doing that with um, the user-centered design process. Um, Samuel, maybe you can explain that a bit better than me. Yeah, sure. So um, the UCD process basically means, um, for those of you who don't know, um, it basically means that users in the center of all design decisions and all concepts. And we really try to make sure that we don't design for our clients or for, for the manager. So we really try to focus for the user. And in the process, we have different steps. And so at the beginning of each, each project, we actually go out to the user, interview them, ask for what they actually need, and try to find out how they work. And then we obviously do the design, um, both conceptual design, visual design, and after that, we go back to the user and try to make sure that what we have done is good for the user. And we give them some prototypes, let them try out stuff, and gather some feedback. Um, so that's basically the part what I do. and. After that, after the user is happy with our designs, we hand it over to the development, and that's where Friedemann comes into the game. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, um, let's give you a short introduction about the problem. So once upon a time, there was a designer who created a beautiful user interface. And um, then this design was, however, developed uh, was however de delivered to uh, to the development, maybe with, uh, with some kind of um, style guide or some other design specification. And yeah, the development start working and sometime later we have a final application which maybe looked something like that. Well, um, yeah, maybe in the first moment that looks pretty good, but if you compare these both versions, you will notice that um, yeah, the, the usual design looked very much better than the final result. And if we have a look in more detail, so what finally went wrong? So we have the wrong icon, we have a wrong font color. Here the shadows are missed, and here is some kind of decoration missing. And yeah, now the discussion about who to blame for that starts. Maybe from a designer perspective, uh, these stupid developers, they always destroy my beautiful crafted design. And um, from our developer's perspective, we say all oh, the lazy designers, there's always missing something in the design specification. And um, yeah, then the product manager comes into the game. So at the end, there's usually also a deadline and the product has to be shipped um, somehow. And so at the end, there's probably not, a much, not enough time left to get the product right. And so, hey. No, it was you. Yeah. <laughs> so at the end, um, the underlying reasons for what happened in the project might be very different, and there are loads of reasons. And at the design, um, the problem might be maybe I just didn't understand the user's goals when I had the analysis phase. Maybe the budget was very tight. Maybe my 
specifications were not really complete. Um, there are tons of reasons what might happen, or my concepts are not good enough, or um, maybe I just don't have enough experience and knowledge about the technology um, for the development. Yeah, um, from the developer's perspective, maybe they don't have any experience with uh, UI development because user interface development. So. Um, a software developer isn't necessarily the same as a user interface developer. There are a lot of additional skills needed. Um, the, the development can misunderstand the requirements. For example, imagine an HMI context where you have buttons which have to represent every time the state of the machine instead of representing, uh, in, instead of, um, displaying just its own state or, um, they maybe have no knowledge about design principle. For example, if they deliver some kind of um, uh, just controls and um, the customer is responsible to build their own views with the controls, they need to know how to do that correctly, that it behaves good and that it looks well. And yeah, finally, the most important thing, um, if the development has no idea about the intention behind the design, then it's very, very complicated to, to, yeah, to, to, to develop the controls like they should behave. Well, um, we have seen we have seen that there is a yeah there the the way from the ID to the final product is very hard and sometimes sometimes also dangerous. The ID to, through design land to develop country and then finally to the to the application and in the next hour we want to talk about um, options how to improve this journey and what we can do to make this way a bit easier. So there are a couple of things we might have to consider. Um, and we are going now in the next half an hour from design land to develop country. And the first step at the beginning is, so is um, how different are the people that are involved. And it's really important, you probably know that designers and developers can be slightly different sometimes. And <laughs> I really like that slide Finman found it a couple of days ago. And it shows it really nicely because in the first moment, developers and designers look quite similar and they are hacking some stuff into their laptops. But if you look closely, the way they think and the way they work is very different. And so if designers and developers look at the same thing, they might have different perceptions of what they see. And it's not about right or wrong, it's just different perspectives they have. So we have a little example that shows exactly that, and um, that's actually something that happens in a lot of cases and in a lot of projects. So um, one of our designers created a little flyout menu and specified it and gave it to the development, and it looked quite similar to that one. So there was a button and the flyout menu and some menu items in there, and the designer added some examples about how many, how many items can be in there and how they look. Um, so the developer also thought, hey, that's clear, I'm gonna do it. Um, but then he finally came to a question what to do when there are three menu items. And there are basically two possibilities, and um, at the end, the designer had a different idea than the developer. Yeah, and from a development perspective, it was, it was pretty clear because there was no specification for this cell here. So um, the developer didn't know how to style and how this this yeah this way to display should yeah, should should be implemented. So again, that's nothing about who to blame or whose fault it is. It's just misunderstandings that happen a lot when designers and developers work together. So it's not only about different perspective, it's also about different knowledge. Designers and developers are different people, they have different jobs to do, and that's also the reason, because they are a designer or a developer. Um, and so we have to find a way to get the knowledge somehow together and form one union with our knowledge. Yeah, and it's also very important that both need to love what they do. So what I mean with that is um, we need to have an intrinsic motivation to to develop a good product. This is very important. That it doesn't make sense if the developer doesn't care about any design decisions. So we need to have fun um, while implementing some controls or 
yeah, work around this pixel stuff. Yeah. So at the end, we can maybe learn that designers and developers are very differently, and they work very different, differently, but at the end, both of them are equally important in the project. And no one, neither the developer or the designer is more important. They are both ne necessary to get a good result. So we have to appreciate our different knowledge and our different perspectives. The next step is to get somehow an understanding. So we have these different knowledges and these different perspectives, and these misunderstandings occur. So we have to find out how we can reduce these misunderstandings, and that's basically by understanding each other in a better way. Yeah, from a developer's perspective, it's good when we tell our designer how we work so they can take care of it. So we need also to tell them about the framework characteristics we use. For example, if we're doing a QML project, it's very important that they know that it's very easy to work with animations, for example, that it's very easy to add some kind of effects or transitions and all these things. And if they know that, they can respect that later in the design. And um, from the other side, it's also very important to tell them about restrictions, for example, yeah, in, in QWidget, it was pretty difficult to work with uh, shadows on the things, and if they know that, they can take care of it. Yeah, so basically, at the end, it comes down to share your knowledge. And if Friedemann tells me about the stuff he does, and I can develop some interest in it, um, then I can respect that in my design decisions and also make sure that what I'm doing is what you need. And, on the other hand, it's also good if the developer knows something about my stuff, about the design process, about the user goals, and about all these design decisions I made in the beginning of the project. Yeah, and it's, it's very important to know the boundaries. Um, for example, if, uh, if the design, the designer of Samuel insists on something, then um, I need to trust him. It has a reason why this should be implemented like this, and um, I need to trust that it will be important for the user experience. And um, in that case, we need to do our, our best to, to, yeah, to, to make the visions real, finally. And also, if something is too time-consuming because, well, maybe the deadline um, isn't far away or um, the budget is low, then we need to explain it and we need to, to discuss maybe some alternative solution. And in the best case, we, we will find a compromise. Yeah, that means also that um, it's very important to have a good relationship uh, between designers and developers. So sometimes it's very important to talk about problems to talk, uh, and to be honest. And um, for that, it's a good idea to, especially in longer projects, to sometimes go out and drink a beer together just to, yeah, to, to, to have a better relationship in this case. Yeah. So make sure that you really share your knowledge and... I know as a designer that you know a whole lot of cool stuff in the development and I also know something a little bit cool about the design. So it's really good if you can share this, this knowledge with each, each other. Now we've crossed these little stones, um, but the next step is a very important one and that's the handover. Um, so in, our projects, as I said before, we first have the design, then we hand it over to the development, and then it's actually implemented. Um, and so for the handover, it's really important that this happens all right. If the handover is bad, the end project result will probably also be bad. But if the handover is good, you can at the end save a lot of time. Yeah, so there are different kind of specification documents um, the designer can provide us. For example, yeah, the control specification itself, they can prepare um, animations, they can prepare um, yeah, breakpoint scaling beha behavior, all these things can be documented. But the most important thing is to understand the overall vision of the designer. So we need to take care um, how we get these, this information. And the best way is to do this kind of hand over face to face. So if if we if he gives me a, a design specification, for example, we usually sit together in a meeting room and he explains me step by step what to do. And this is very important. And um, at this moment, I can 
tell him what I need to implement the design specification. For example, if I need additional information like, uh, yeah, maybe an interactive prototype or something which would help me to, to understand better what, what, what the intention was, then I can ask him to do this for me. So, um, it's very important to, to understand the behavior instead of, yeah, just styling the controls anywhere. So, um, this is um, a kind of interactive prototy prototype which uh, Samuel prepared for me. And if you have as a developer something like this, it's, it's much more easier to, to understand how all these things should work together. And yeah, if you have something like this, then you don't need to read uh, hundreds of pages of documentation, for example, because it's, I can directly see how, how, this, how it should behave. And I don't, don't have to write the specification. <laughs> it's much more fun to do, do a prototype than writing PDFs. Okay, um, well, I already explained most of the things here on the slide, so, but it's not bad to repeat it again. So, sometimes, um, in some projects, we developers are the first non-designer who, um, had to really think in to, to think very deep into the, into the design and into the user interface. And at this point, we will notice maybe some problems with um, first-time use or especially edge cases or in-between cases, or we will notice uh, that, uh, that something is missing with a scaling behavior. Or, um, yeah, we have the questions, okay, and, and what happens if the user clicks here? And all these things we can directly or we should directly uh, discuss with, with the designer. Yeah, all these things with first-time use and edge cases is something we at the design actually don't think about too much. So in the design, we think about what happens if, if, if the user needs this or needs that, and we, we think about the 80% solution for the user to make sure we, um, we have all concepts and all, all scenarios implemented and we have the functionality the user needs. But something like you see on the image, it's basically a... Um, a message box which shows warnings and errors and of course we care in the design about what happens if the list is too long and what happens if the cl user clicks on it but actually the first time use state or like the state when it's empty we don't focus too much on the design and that's a reason why me, we might forget something and so be patient with us and just ask us and we will not be angry if you ask us on the other hand it, if you ask us, it shows me that you are really interested and in, in trying to get the knowledge. So, to sum up the third chapter, get the designer's vision and do a handover face to face and ask every, everything you need. So, the fourth step is about collaboration. Also, after the handover, you have to communicate a lot and collaborate a lot. And we also have some, some tips for that. Because otherwise it ends like this. And that's actually happens a lot of time. Uh, the designer might be slightly annoyed when you ask so many questions and give some answers that don't help you, like just implement the standard behavior, which of course is hard for you because there usually is no standard behavior. Or I just say that it's obvious and it might be obvious in my mind, but not in yours. And on the other hand, the de developer feels that the designer is, is not trying very hard. And so he's also not trying a hard, very hard and maybe just doesn't ask and just does it like he wants to be or he pretends it not, it's not possible, but it actually at the end would be possible. So what can you do to, to pre prevent that? First, it's very important that you communicate early in the project, not just at the handover and maybe a little bit after. Try to be involved in the project already when I'm doing the designs. It's not something that I feel bad about if the developer sits in the meeting and try, tries to tell me what I have to do. No, it really helps. So I really appreciate it when, when in a project and where we're making design decisions, there's also a developer at the table and maybe he tells me, uh, me something about the technology or the framework or what's, what's possible to, to do and what's hard to do. 
And on the other hand, you will get the right image and you will get the vision and you will understand why I make certain design decisions. You also have to communicate longer in the project. Not just the handover and then it's done. Try to have the designer working with you through all the development project. So um, when we are having projects, um, we have the good situation that it's actually part of our process. Um, and so I have about 10% of the whole development time allocated for me as a designer. And that's actually really good. And we usually need that time because there will be questions and there will be missing states or missing controls or our customer might just have new requirements and I have to, to design something else. And if you don't have that time, you will probably, as a developer, end up alone and just have to think about all that stuff yourself that is actually um, part of the designer's job. Communicate very frequently. We have some little chat bubbles here. Um, we try to communicate every day in a project, and it usually <laughs> starts like um, Friedemann has a question about a control, or I forgot a state, and so Friedemann asks me, hey, what does the press state look like? And usually these things are sorted out within two or three minutes. So it's not a lot of time. And if it gets more complicated, we switch to the phone or make a screen sharing, but it's really important that you keep in contact during the development. Yeah, this is an example we just had a few weeks ago. Um, Samuel wanted, um, no, I needed to style a Q3 view with uh, QSR style sheets, and he wanted to have um, the space for this small triangle with an width of 60 pixels, but he also wanted um, that the offset for the hierarchy levels were 40 pixels. But this isn't actually really possible to do this uh, with QSR style sheets because you can only set one indent and this indent is also used for this triangle into the space. So what I finally did is um, I asked Samuel, I, I, I talked to him via phone and I explained him, okay, so there are a few possibilities. The, the easiest one would be to, well, just um, adjust the indent a bit or yeah, I, I, I had to touch some C++ code to, to make this possible. And yeah, we found an easy solution. We just took, we just said, okay, let's take 50 pixels. The difference is negligible and, um, yeah, it, it will save a lot of time in the development later. Yeah. And, um, this is also something very important. It is definitely, definitely not a best case scenario, but in some projects, um, there will be something changed on the design while we have already started implementing the controls. And especially in this case, it's very important to, to communicate a lot. And, um, every time I start, uh, I would like to start with the, with the development of a new control. I will directly ask him, uh, Hey Samuel, um, do you think that some, something will change or is, is this control already finished for 100%? And then he can give me the green light and I will start to develop the control. So to make sure that the quality of your work in a design way is what I have, um, what I wanted to have, um, a similar, it's good to make re design reviews. And, um, really often it's like this. You have a design and then you have a develop development. And like one day before shipping, the designer looks at it again and there might be some, some differences. And then there's not enough time to, corrected. And so try to make design re reviews frequently. Um, for me as a designer, design reviews are always a little bit hard because I have to criticize you guys, your, you guys um, for what you are doing. And I have to say, hey, that's wrong and that's wrong and this doesn't look right. And I don't really feel good when, <laughs> when I have to do that with your work because I know that you tried really hard. Um, so just keep in mind, it's part of my job to to make design reviews, and it's part of part of my job to focus on all these little details. Another method you can use is uh, retrospectives after the project. Um, so there are a million 
different um, different ways to do retrospectives. Um, the key of a retrospective is to get feedback of your your teammates um, and to get honest feedback, not just really maybe a mail, just talk to uh, talk about the project face to face and the way we usually do it is like this we literally have these blocks on a whiteboard or a flip chart and then everyone collects some post-its and writes down what he's what he has thought about the project and so there might be negative points there might be questions there might be points to discuss um, also you shouldn't forget the positive stuff but the key of all of this is to get feedback and to make sure if there were problems you can do it better in the next project. So at the end, both of you are in one team and both of you want to create a good product and you have the same goals and so you also should collaborate and communicate as a team. So we are finally in developed country and um, the last chapter is about Qt. So um, this little prototype, um, it shows, you have seen it already, I know, but it shows like a lock screen um, for an industrial machine. It's a very large food processing machine and basically you would slide up the lock screen if you want to see the interface and then you can log in. And after the login, you see the actual interface. And on the other hand, you already, you of course, can slide down again. Um, and that's the thing which I was really surprised. It was great fun to design um, such a thing. But if it were made in other technologies, it would probably have been not possible in that way. So um, I'm not a I'm not a developer. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but usually when I'm when I'm making broad projects that are not in Qt, the developer would say, "Oh, that's really complicated," or "Scaling behavior responsive is not possible," and animations are are very very hard with the performance. And um, that's actually a cute uh, a cute thing about Qt. <laughs> so um, Friedemann actually encouraged me to add some animations and to think about transitions and all that stuff. And in this case, we actually ended up doing all that stuff together. So um, I made a design draft, and I made this this prototype, um, and handed it over to Friedemann, and then. Obviously, he wrote the code because I know nothing about development. <laughs> but um, we did all the transition fine-tuning and the animation fine-tuning together. And we really sat side by side um, and thought about easing types and animation duration and tried to, to get out the last few percent out of the product. Yes. But, yeah. Uh, it was one time. It was pretty funny because uh, we had together a look in the code, and he just said, "Oh, can we make this a bit slower, maybe?" Um, I was looking to my code, and the, oh, I think it should be adjusted here. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm not used uh, to 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 see that designers um, understand something in my mm -hmm. code. And yeah, QML is very lightweight. It's very easy to understand. It's declarative yeah. and. Yeah, so also designers can understand something when it's necessary. <laughs> actually, actually if, if you know a bit of CSS, it's not too hard to understand the QML code. I could not write it, but if I look at it, I, I, I have an idea what will happen. So, of course, we have our tools, and I start with scribbling, and then I'm doing the designs, and I, I like doing these prototypes in Antotype, or other persons might use Sketch or Illustrator. And of course, the developer has different tools. But at the end, our work can be, little, be a little bit closer together, so we can close the gap between design and development a little bit. Yeah, so we already started to use QML and Qt um, as already in the design and already in the prototype, so especially in the prototyping phase of such a project. And um, 
it's pretty cool because you can very quickly try out animations and all these things. And finally, we're able to reuse some code snippets in the later development project. And this is why, um, yeah, why it's a very good thing to do development, so user interface development projects with Qt. So at the end, you can really s save time with, with Qt and by doing it together. Now, we have finally ar arrived at Develop Country, and um, if you happen to work together with designers, maybe just try this a little bit and try to appreciate that you're different and um, share your knowledge and try to do, do a really good face-to-face -face and over and really communicate together as a team. Um, because designers and developers might look different a little bit and behave different and have a different way to think, but um, both of them are really cool people and um, we are having a lot of fun in our projects. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so we have a few minutes left. Um, are there any questions here? Um, yeah, you use uh, Adobe Illustrator um, during this design process. Uh, what is your usual um, step from coming from Illustrator or PDF or whatever the output is of Illustrator to uh, a QML design, basically? Um, usually, we don't use Illustrator. Um, so it's one tool we, we use depending on what the project is like, but um, usually we use a tool called Antitype. Um, I don't know if you have heard about it. Um, it's actually developed by our company. And um, in Antitype, we can do um, the conceptual design with wireframes and also the visual design. And there we also can, can do these dynamic prototypes. And so at the end, that's the base for our specifications. And we also give this Antitype file to our developers so they can have a look at it and they click on an element and directly see the size and the color and, and the dimensions. Um, so actually we don't use Illustrator too much if it's possible to work with Antitype. Any other questions? So I'm a little bit curious about the topic testing because yeah. um, the design concept has to be tested somehow and how can you integrate uh, the testing people into that process? What's your idea of that? Um, we usually try to do the testing at an early stage in the project. So if it's possible, we do the validation even before the visual design. So we um, make some wireframe frames and we, we make sure we don't spend too much time in, in refining all the details. And already then we go out to, to the uh, end users and test it. So, um, so we try to do the validation very early and just after the concepts are finished, we hand it over to the development. Was that your question or? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, the testing on the development. Yeah. Are you talking? Yeah, sometimes it depends on the customer. So um, often the customers, um, they have its own tools which they want to use. Um, yeah, it, it depends. There are different tools on the market uh, which are doing uh, yeah for, for uh, automated UI testing. I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, how can we get, uh, we developers, uh, the, <laughs> like these graphical thinking design people into thinking about things like 
accessibility and more like information flow, which is like how we think and we kind of sometimes complain that the designers are so graphical and how do we get them there? That's one question. And the other question is that the tool you mentioned uh, is developed in your country, uh, company. Any chance to have it as free software? This, would, <laughs> this is just missing so much. So it would be the standard if it's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the first question was for you, maybe. Um, yeah, how we, um, the question was how can we get the design thinking into the development kind of thinking? Oh, yeah. if I was. How can we get the designers to think about things like accessibility, for example, which is... Because there's okay, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely, absolutely true. And... Um, and the design, we sometimes we sh maybe we should think about it, but usually we don't think too much about it. And um, I think it's at that point it's really important to to be together very early. Um, so if you if you are actually in the meeting when we are doing the the main layouts and the basic um, the basic design decisions, maybe if you, if you trigger us and ask about that even then at the early stage maybe we we can do it so that would be my my tip yeah and i don't really know what to answer to your second question <laughs> but i think that uh, the software will not will not be open <laughs> no. because it's uh, it's also written it's also it's only available for mac so it's a mac only tool and yeah <laughs> That's a free trial, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? So, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.